Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it is really great uh, to be here at Penn. I think that the design in my civic data design lab really came from my experience here. And I learned, I very much learned to be a designer. As, uh, as you say, I had, you know, I had been a geographer and then uh, kind of got really interested in landscape architecture. Um, and then went on to do planning. And I think I actually mash up all of those things. So Penn was a really important component of, of that history. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Although when I look at this building, I do think of many, many sleepless hours in Meyerson Hall, which I'm sure you all can relate to. Um, so I not only run the Civic Data Design Lab, but I also run the Leventhal Center uh, for Advanced Urbanism. Um, and uh, the center is really uh, associated with 40 different faculty. We have 40 affiliated faculty from architecture, urban planning, media arts, arts and scientists. And it's the idea that to answer and solve the problem of our cities, we really need a cross-disciplinary approach. So we work on uh, problems of the city. I myself am very cross-disciplinary and we just learned I combined my training in computation and design uh, to create communication strategies um, that bring broad, bring issues to broad audiences. So not just speaking to academia or not just speaking to a policy community, but I hope that the work of bridging these fields helps bring uh, this information to the public. And it's something that I talk about in my book, um, Data Action. So just to illustrate data action very quickly through one project, one of my oldest projects, I think, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna describe it to you. And I think why it's important to show this old project is it's still having impact today. So this project was done in uh, 2008 and, um, was just on the walls of the Museum of Modern Art until two months ago. Um, so you can see how the work that you do today uh, can have a history. Um, and uh, so this project, we took data from the prison incarceration system, um, actually from 10 different cities, but here we're looking at that in Brooklyn. And we looked at uh, where people lived before they went into prison and then we mapped where they lived and we added it up block by block. And these very red blocks show you uh, where over a million dollars is spent to incarcerate people from that block in one year. So if you zoom in, you see just these 17 blocks, over $17 million is spent to incarcerate people from this block. And the idea of these maps was to expose that, you know, these same blocks don't have edu proper education. These same blocks don't have job training programs. These same blocks don't have proper health care. These same blocks don't have proper health care. If we spent just one million of that dollar to invest in those blocks rather than investing in the prison systems in which they go to, how might we change or redevelop the neighborhood? We had a exhibition at the Architecture League in New York where we brought together criminal justice advocates, policy experts, um, uh, planning uh, to think about how we could reinvest in the, the, the community of those 17 blocks. Ultimately, these maps went up in the Museum of Modern Art actually in 2008 and now they come back, they, they come in and they come out of fashion and I'll tell you why, uh, but in this first, uh, time in 2008, a congressman saw these maps on the wall and contacted us and asked if he could use, and we didn't just do this in Brooklyn, these maps are in Brooklyn, but we did it in uh, uh, 12 cities across the U.S., and he asked if he could use them to advocate for the Criminal Justice Reinvestment Act, which allocated money for re-entry programming. So you can see that we only allocated $25 million, but that's just a small amount to like reinvest in those communities and help people coming back um, from prison. So this is what I think taking data to action is all about. It's building expert teams. We worked with criminal justice policy experts. We had data scientists. We had graphic designers. We have architects. 
uh, we collected the data uniquely, we quantified it also in a unique way, uh, ground truth the results by talking with the community about what they saw and whether it rang true to them, and opening that data up through visualizations in order to have a conversation. The reason these maps were just recently in the Museum of Modern Art is because during the, uh, let's say, defund the police movement, these maps got used as a way to advocate for that. I wouldn't say that we are advocating for defunding the police, like I, but, but we are advocating for reinvesting the money that we spend on the criminal justice system into communities themselves. Um, so when I thought about today, like how would I arrange the talk and all the projects that I wanted to tell you about, I thought that I would order them in the data action principles that I talk about in my book. So the first principle um, that I think is really important when we're working with data um, is to do no harm. And we must interrogate the reasons we want to use data and determine the potential for our work to do more harm than good. Um, and this is kind of thinking about the Hippocratic Oath. We, we as data specialists should also be taking some kind of oath. And I think at that premise, it's thinking about that potential. So in this project, I'm going to uh, talk about, um, I worked in Nairobi, Kenya. And if you're not familiar, I've been doing work in Nairobi for almost 20 years. If you're not familiar with Nairobi, this is a typical seat street scene. Um, and one of the things that you notice is there are a lot of buses on the road. And I was doing a transportation model for Nairobi, and I, I didn't have data on the buses and where they went. And you, I mean, this is obviously a major depot downtown, but they do represent close to 80% of the cars on the roadway. And I thought, how is this possible? We don't have information about where these buses go or where they stop. Um, and I really needed it for uh, my model. So what we decided to do is work with the Nairobi Computer Science Department, and we created an app in which um, uh, students ran on every single bus route and took their routes and their stop. And I just stop and note the reason, you know, we worked with the computer science, we were MIT, we could have built the technology, but I think in all the projects, we're really interested in the technology staying where it's built, being contextualized by the people who live there, and being useful to the context in which they use phones and applications. And one thing that was really exciting about this project is lots of the students went to their hometown and then mapped their buses as well. So that shows the benefit of building technology in the place that you're at. We also uh, collected the data in uh, GTFS. How many people know what GTFS is? This is a good audience. Yeah, like mostly I have one person raise their hand. I assumed that there would be more in this group of uh, data experts. But for those of you who don't know what GTFS is, you have probably all used it. So if you've ever routed yourself in Google Maps and you've picked public transport, the back end data set is a GTFS data set. It allows us to understand public transport and route ourselves in Google Maps. But there are also a lot of open source software that use GTFS as a standard. You can look at accessibility studies. The reason I stop and note this, why am I spending so much time talking about this, is I think when you collect your own data, it's really important to look at and see if there's a data standard that exists for that data type already, because it's instantly going to make your data much more usable. So there are so much open source software that uses GTFS at the base. And this was really important for, you might not think in Nairobi that this would be important, but it is very important because now we had access to a lot of tools that we didn't have before. Therefore, we had a hackathon with the local technology community in Nairobi to teach them about GTFS and some of the open source software. And from that, there are five apps that were developed. This is one that's like a routing app that a local tech community created using that open source software. Um, 
It was the first uh, informal transit system that got put into Google Maps for that same reason. Now there are many. Um, we have to break that barrier. So if you imagine most, uh, most uh, cities in the world have these kind of systems. Um, and you know, here you can see the data coming in. Um, you know, GTFS is a simple text file of latitude and longitude information. But as you can see, as we're get collecting the data, you can see all of these overlapping routes. And I mean, this just looks like the city streets of Nairobi. And we really wanted not just a way to create a data set for my model, but I was shocked that the average person in Nairobi didn't have access to information about their subway. So we decided to start thinking about a way that we could visualize this data. And so we started to kind of create a structure much like you might see here in Philly of the subway or New York or London. Um, and we used um, these kind of landmarks. When you navigate in Nairobi, you talk about big landmarks and then you go from there. So you say, I'm going to Nakima or I'm going to Junction. And then uh, we ultimately developed this map and then we asked um, both the bus drivers and the owners of the, the buses to help us edit this map. So you can see them working with us here uh, to make sure that the con context made sense. One of the things that they're doing right here is actually uh, looking at the upper areas of Nairobi and they're wondering why there's not matatus. There's lots of social political reasons for that, but like kind of they are instantly using uh, this map as a planning tool. They hadn't had the ability to see um, this together in this kind of way. Um, we not only edited it with bus drivers and owners, we uh, showed it to the government, um, and we had user studies with uh, people who ride uh, the buses as well to kind of help us edit and create something that was contextual. Ultimately, we were really excited that the newspaper, we put it in inserts so you could actually get uh, an insert of the map. And ultimately, um, the city of Nairobi made it the official map of the city. So, you know, semi-formal transit provides mobility around the world. It's not just in Nairobi. And in fact, the majority of the world's cities depend on these systems. In our project, uh, helps for projects and inspire project all the way from Amman to Managua. And now we have a resource center that um, that helps people map their city. And we've worked with these different cities. And what I would say is that we are not interested in doing the mapping ourselves, but rather providing people the resources to do the work. So what our resource center, we have a headquarters in Addis and the headquarters in Mexico City. What they do is provide the resources, training, and a lot of times what happens is like, um, so we just did a project in Dominican Republic and we had um, a, a smaller city in Mexico go to the Dominican Republic and train them so that it's not, it's more South-South learning or kind of more regional learning and people teaching each other rather than us being involved. And I think that's also really important for sustainability of like data building projects. Um, sharing data is also one of my principles, uh, as you saw earlier, and sharing data is essential for communicating the need for policy change and generating a de debate essential for that work. And I obviously share data, like we shared that GTFS data set. Oh, let me just step back. I forgot to the do no harm. Why did I mention that Nairobi project in doing no harm? Um, and the reason is because a lot of cities have come to us and asked us to map their informal transit system. And then we talk to the local tech community and we find by making that map, we are making that system vulnerable for government crackdown, retribution, or possible removal of that system overall. And we have recommended that, we, that they do not make those map in that case. So while we, of course we would want a Trump public transport map, it's not always good to do something like that because it might do more harm than good. So that's why that's that's why that one fits in that principle. Um, and, and it's important to think about if your data were to expose somebody, if it might do more harm than good. All right, so sharing data, I like to share data as a raw data form, but I also think sharing comes through visualization. So 
In this uh, project, uh, we partnered with the World Food Program, the Migration Policy Institute, of course my lab, the Inter-American um, Development Bank, and the Organization of American States, and we interviewed 5,000 uh, households in Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador, asking them issues around why they migrate. Um, the data sample was taken uh, from regions in which, in these countries, um, where peer, people are experiencing high levels of migration. So we looked at like where migrants were being sent back to from the U.S. Um, and sampled those areas. Um, we asked uh, questions around violence, what are the reasons, how much did it cost, and together with the World Food Program, we created a report, um, the kind they traditionally made um, but our team really wanted a way to communicate the insights in a new way. We felt like the report message wasn't getting across. There were just so many reports in their office stacked. Like just looking in their bookcase, I saw stacks and stacks of similar reports. And um, so for uh, November 2021 congressional hearing and release of the report, the World Food Program took a leap of faith and allowed us to produce a website to use at the hearing that would explore, would allow the congressional um, aides and congressmen to explore the data in their own way. So the website contextualized the work in the larger historic framework. Um, so it should come as no surprise. Um, that the number of refugee and asylum seekers from the northern countries of Central America has soared in the past five years. And studies have shown food security, violence, climate variability are all factors for why people flee. One of the biggest insights of the report was the sheer financial burden which migrants take on. And like, can you believe that we found that in one year, migrants from Central America spent $2.2 .2 billion to migrate to the U.S., which is like an incredible amount of money. Uh, yet the U.S. benefits from these migrants entering our agricultural labor force. Close to 73% of uh, U.S. agricultural labor force are migrants. At the same time, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security spent $2.9 billion to keep these same migrants out. So we're kind of all this money is being wasted, like both by the migrants themselves and by the U.S. and kind of fighting this problem. And while migrants take on all the risks, only 57% actually make it to the U.S. So that's 40% of that 2.2 billion is lost. Um, and um, one of the things that we found in the study is that remittances provide basic needs for those in their home country. So we, you know, when we hear when we hear about remittances, you often think uh, it's going to an extra road or extra room in your house. But our finding found that it's just putting food on the table um, or providing shelter or, or basic clothing or needs. Um, so it comes as no surprise overall that we found financial insecurity motivates migrants. So even you know if climate change is a, a reason, it's the financial insecurity due to that. Um, and then we created a tapestry of motivations, um, and each one of these squares represents a migrant and their motivation to migrate. Um, and then we looked at that across income levels, food security. Ultimately, we made the recommendation uh, to the Congress that um, <clears throat> they should create more temporary visas for Central American migrants. So, um, you know, of the temporary visas that we have, 93% go to Mexicans. And what we were suggesting is that they open up more temporary visas for Central American migrants uh, using like many of these findings uh, as evidence. That is exactly what 33 senators told the Biden administration citing, the fi citing this report in their findings. Um, and in June of 2022, Biden announced a bill creating more legal pathways uh, for migration for Central American migrants. Um, after uh, the kind of 
findings, we went back and asked congressional aides, like, w what was the effect of the visualization on uh, their, let's say, uh, letter or report or understanding of the issue? And many of them said that having the ability to play with the data while we were talking to them and kind of slice and dice and investigate it was made it felt as though the information was more open and that they could find their own insights in the information itself. Now, of course, I am presenting that information to them, so it, it includes all of my biases, but I think this way of being interacting with data creates a different kind of learning process that allows people to uptake that information um, in a different kind of way. And I'm sure you guys can all relate to that when you're looking at your GIS maps and you're kind of just like, this doesn't make sense. Why would this happen? This ability to play with data, I think, is really important component to updating the insights that it has. So again, this is really taking data to action, uh, building this team, collecting the data uniquely for quantifying it, ground truthing it, and then opening up for visualization. So I wanted to tell you about a fun part of this project because one of the things that, you know, after we had been able to present this data, we felt like the migrants weren't able to participate in our data analysis, right? We were using their data, but like they should be telling their story, not, not just uh, us kind of presenting their story. So we thought about how could we do that? So taking the idea that um, this kind of tapestry of motivations and in Central America tapestries are very important to the culture and taking the fact that they spent $2.2 billion, we decided to create a tapestry out of money. If you're not familiar, but when the Bolivarier dropped, they started to create and weave bags out of this worthless money. Um, here's another image of that. So we decided to create money from the report. Um, and so here you can see some of the findings of this 210 billion US dollars, 73% of higher crop workers, um, right? And so this dollar represents the climate change motivation. Um, and uh, you can see that we added kind of different facts and findings uh, from that. Blue represents financial security or represents economic reasons that a migrant might want to migrate. So here we see that 64% finance it from loan and most of them use irregular channels or smugglers to migrate. Um, we created uh, a piece of money. This one is representing quality of life. And so like, one of the facts that you can see here is that on average, a migrant only makes $290 a month. And migration is not a choice. They don't want to leave their country, but they're just not making the funds. Um, here you can see um, the Guatemalan bill shows that written remittances make up 50 15% of the Guatemalan GDP, and 95% of remittances are received just to go to sustain life, as I mentioned earlier. And then finally, the purple bill represented um, a security. So working with migrants in a shelter called Casa Tuchan, uh, we worked and developed a tapestry, uh, and each bill represented one migrant. Um, here's a kind of zoom in of the tapestry. So what you can see is that obviously blue or financial reasons are the main motivations. And this tapestry uh, was presented in the World Food Program headquarters in Rome. This is David Beasley, who was the head of this program with um, uh, the ambassador to Panama. And we had this tapestry presented during uh, the World Food Program General Assembly. So that meant ambassadors from all over the world um, were able to look at the tapestry. And you could then take one of those dollars and scan it on this computer screen, and it would tell you a story of that migrant um, and their motivations. So trying to connect and create empathy with the data or connect people more that each data point is a person and um, their story. Um, so here is the opening where we had um, ambassadors. Um, and I think one of the things that it shows is that 
Transforming data into art also transforms the conversation that we can have and really created a, like an opening for a discussion that might not have been there before. So the Venezuelan ambassador even like started to have a conversation with us. Usually they are very defensive about migration from Venezuela. And I think what, you know, one of the things that was most impactful you know, is the Honduran ambassador said, you, commu you communicated the issue of migration with dignity, showing that migrants do not want to leave but feel like they have no choice. But this ability, but what it really did is help the World Food Program garnered a lot of attention and resources from this uh, meeting to bring the attention of this problem. Um, they used that General Assembly to get, get funds for particular issues. And in a case where the Ukraine was getting a lot of funding and the migration issue was being forgot, it helped bring attention back to that issue. Um, here are some other images from that. One of the things that we found in our study is that migrants along the Darien Gap come from 42 different countries. Um, so like the border between Colombia and Panama, places as far away as Vietnam, Korea, West Africa. Um, I don't have time to get into that part of the study, but I just thought it was really impactful um, to think about these people coming, all coming through um, um, really, um, uh, filling it. And uh, the tapestry and money was recently on exhibition in the Venice Biennale. It's actually there right now um, in Venice as part of the art and architecture uh, exhibit. So if you're in Venice, check it out. Um, so the next project. So that's sharing data. So we shared it in lots of different ways, both through data visualizations, but also physical. I think one thing that data can really do is change power dynamics, and building data helps change the power dynamics inherent in controlling and using data, while having numerous side benefits such as teaching uh, data literacy. So in this project, we're going to go back to Nairobi. I've done a lot of work in Nairobi. And in this project, um, I worked with the Facebook Data for Good team, and they um, shared data with me, which I can't show a lot of it, um, but uh, just to give you an example of what a Facebook data set looks like, they, they aggregate it to a grid, but each one of these dots represents a person or somebody using or accessing at that moment in time, and they have all kinds of information, like how, what are you downloading, uh, how fast is your phone, um, Lots of, they have lots of information on us, which we all know, all right? But I'm really interested is how we can take that data and use it for something good. So we took some of the information. What I really wanted to know was how good was internet access in Nairobi? Like how well could people access the internet? Now, most people use data on their phone to get internet. So understanding that question isn't just about like, do you have fiber in your community. It's more does, do you have the ability to download or get data um, from uh, satellite or from your uh, kind of Wi-Fi reception on your phone? So we look at download speeds, carriers, like whether you have 3G or 4G on your phone. And like taking all of this data, we created what we call the city's connectivity index. Um, uh, it comes as no surprise that many of uh, these red areas are in the lowest income communities in Nairobi. Um, in this project, we also did ground truthing. We went out to each one of these areas, checked the internet speed, um, um, and you know, kind of checked the accuracy of our model itself. Uh, because this data existed not just in Nairobi that we could uh, replicate the model, in other places like Kampala. And one thing I should just say is Facebook is the number one used app in, in Kenya and in many African cities because they use the messaging app for like for, as a phone mostly. Um, and this includes like WhatsApp as well uh, data, just so you know, um, just to talk about bias in your data set for a second. Uh, but um, so we were able to do this in Kampala, and then we were able to apply the model uh, to Accra, Addis, Casablanca, Lagos, um, and we were really excited 
to be able to use this data to help think about improvement of this infrastructure. This happened and Facebook didn't want to release this and I got very upset <laughs> at Facebook and I thought, how can we counter that narrative and actually use this to do something good and provide internet in these communities? So what we did is partner up with Concui Design Initiative, um, which is uh, an organization which works in Cabrera, which is one of the lowest income communities in, um, in uh, Nairobi. And the KDI uh, focuses on co-designing community spaces, and they have 12 different public spaces that they have throughout, um, throughout Cabrera, or this informal settlement. Um, and what we did is partner with them to co-design a wireless network and data collection tool. So um, the idea is that if we could create a wireless network that also collected data, that the community could sell back and use, it could help create a business uh, for them. Um, this grant came like right before COVID. Literally, we got it like maybe three months before COVID. So it was very, very timely. Like these communities really needed internet. So I think also what's great about that is we did most of the work over Zoom and our partners in Nairobi were doing most of the work. So we held workshops about what is an internet hotspot? Why would it be useful to have it? What is data? Why would you want to collect it? What kind of data might you want? And then we asked community members like in these training, and you can see like we're in COVID times during this, uh, wearing a mask. Um, to fill out an RFP about what they would do or what kind of data they would collect and why do they think having an internet at their public space would be useful. From that RFP, we selected four different sites to work with um, based on kind of their interest and their business plan. Um, and then we worked uh, with Vuma, which is like a community center. They, they're a younger group. They have lots of watching football maps the uh, foot football matches we worked with, um, ABC, which is a laundry and playground, Sun Center, which is a nonprofit group, and then a school, a local school. Uh, we held trainings about what is a wireless network, how do you put that wireless information up. Um, we, um, here you can see those trainings, and then we created training materials that are actually on our website that anybody can use. And so the idea is that if you want to build your own community Wi-Fi network, you can download all of our um, information. I'm not going to go into the technical details of how we set up the system, but it comes from an educational Wi-Fi connection that we then produced an antenna to uh, distribute throughout um, and create this mesh network. And this is just like what it looks like in one of the community centers. Um, ultimately, um, this is them installing it again all through Zoom. So the technology transfer is, is really, I think one of the great things is that they really had to build this network uh, without having us there. Okay, so now let's get to the data part. Uh, so it took us a while to build the network. What kinds of data could the community collect? So one of the things that like happens in Cumbera is one of the most overstudied community. So many social services and social workers come in, ask questions about issues of why are they at certain income levels? What kinds of education level? Like you can't imagine how many surveys this group gets and they never benefit from that data like, you know, the surveyor comes in, takes the survey that goes into a UN, World Food Program report, all kinds of reports. So what we decided is in order to get access to the internet, you uh, could take a survey or you could, you know, buy the internet. But then the surveys were things that um, these um, different researchers can pay the community groups to put on their system. So basically you're paying, I guess, any one of us who might do research in Nairobi. So it's mostly academics and other kinds of like World Bank. Um, and then the other data that they wanted is air quality data because air quality in Kibera is really bad. Um, 
and and it's because of uh, coal burning, so lack of infrastructure. So they wanted a way to create evidence for that for uh, the government. So when you so each it, actually each Wi-Fi hotspot had an air quality sensor. It has an air quality. They're still up. Uh, <laughs> um, so like just to give you an example, what happens? You come in to the Wi-Fi network to use it. And you ask whether you want to pay or whether you want to take a survey. Um, and so the pay, the like cost 20 shillings is like 20 cents, like for um, a half an hour. And then you can ask. So the first survey we had was about this road that was getting constructed through Cabera and was affecting a lot of community members. So we put a survey on to say, were you affected? How were you affected? Did you get any funding from the government or any ways to remove that? And we were able to then use that to get resources for those community members through that uh, first survey. Um, and then we literally added uh, Nairobi to the map. You can see that in Africa, there's not enough data. Um, and so kind of adding it to this part global network. And so here, the value is not just the infrastructure development, but it's the social development that happened along this project. So we can use big data to understand that people lack internet, but it's about then taking it the next step and using that data to create some kind of action. The Living Data Hubs is a kind of big group of people, KDI, Tuna Panda, and other partners in Kenya, and they are still working on that project after I'm gone, and they just actually presented at Mozilla Nairobi. I'm super excited, and they're expanding that network after we've uh, initial work with them. Of course, we support them, but that is the idea that it will be sustainable p past the research grant. Okay, so exposing hidden systems is another thing that I'm really interested in, and I think and a principle of data for action uh, so coming up ways ways to uniquely acquire, quantify, and model data um, exposes messages uh, previously hidden from the public eye. And but we should remember to expose those ideas going back to the original principles of doing no harm. So sometimes we can expose ideas with data, but we have to remember about thinking about whether it would do more harm than good. So how many people are familiar with the idea of ghost cities? Many of you, right? And so ghost cities are large cities that remi remain vacant um, in China, but they also are smaller uh, developments inside uh, Chinese cities themselves. So lots of like small residential developments. And finding da data about where these va vacant developments are is really hard and also very controversial because it would expose the risk in the Chinese real estate market. So we wanted a way to find these ghost cities and understand the extent of them. And so we created a model that says a thriving community needs amenities. We need restaurants, we need grocery stores, we need like a place to get our hair cut, right? Could we use a model that looks at access to amenities as a way of identifying whether there is a ghost or these smaller development, not the whole, we know where Ordos is, not those, but. And so we scraped data from Dan Ping, which is the Chinese version of Yelp, uh, to get our amenity data. And then we scraped data of residential locations from AMAP and Baidu. Uh, a, um, and then we created 300 meter by 300 meter cell covering those residential locations. Then we measured from the center of that cell the closest amenity. Um, and one of the things that we did when we uh, did these distance measurements was to understand whether an amenity had a review or not. So if it had zero reviews, we said probably people are not going to that amenity or it's not kind of popular. We then um, applied, uh, made an amenity score based on Hansen's gravitational model that measures urban accessibility. And we use this model because it takes into account that if you live further from a city center, you're going to drive further to an amenity, right? So the distance, you know, I'll drive 20 minutes uh, if I'm living in a suburb. Then we took those amenity scores that were uh, very low 
And then we perform spatial autocorrelation on those cells that remain. So like if you're near another low amenity score, you're most likely uh, a, a ghost city. And then what we did is uh, we, uh, sorry, we ground truth our data in three different cities, Tianjin, Xinjiang, and uh, Chengdu. Um, and I'm just going to give you an example of some of the things that we found. We found places like this. Um, this was built like five to seven years from the time that we did the work. Um, you can see here um, this uh, development, sorry, this development lies largely vacant. And the Chinese government would say the value of the production and the economics to produce this was more valuable than whether it got sold or not. And in some cases, these developments are completely sold, but it's a form of investment. So before the, before the Chinese had a stock market, the only way you invested your funds were through these things. And some Chinese residents had four or five homes or the average. We found things like this. This is an older housing block that's being ready for redevelopment. So not necessarily the ghost city in the way that you typically think of them. Um, and then we found um, other uh, um, whole cities like this one um, that were um, lying vacant. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and uh, uh, like largely the jobs never came. So they never created a job base, and therefore people didn't want to move there. Um, so one of the principles that I talk about is ground truthing. And we, in each one of these projects that like ground truth, I didn't focus on the ground truthing. Maybe you guys can ask me any questions about how. But I think ground truthing is really essential. We must validate the work we do by literally observing the phenomenon on the ground or asking those that are in the data or affected by it whether what we have interpreted rings true to them. So in this project, we actually, after we did the Ghost Cities, we created a website. Um, and each cell, when you click on it, you, we're trying to make the Hansen's gravitational model more accessible to the average person. So what you're seeing in each cell is why that particular cell has a high amenity. So this is not near a mall or a school or a KTV. It's trying to help you understand. Um, obviously, it's not an odd, like exact representation, but it can help the public understand how uh, these ghost cities operated. And then we brought them to Chinese planners. So we asked uh, and met with Chinese planners in each one of these cities. And I think what was really great about ground truthing in this way is instead of saying like, oh, we have data that says that, we say, let's explore the data together. What do you think about this issue? And this planner told us, you know, vacant developments are really controversial to the local politics, that local planners aren't involved in that decision making at all, but that, inform that or that, so she claims, uh, <laughs> like that the decisions are coming from higher up, and that local planners know that placing these developments in these areas are not going to work without kind of creating the amenities that are needed for those communities. This real estate agent, when we talked to him, was really candid. And he said the worst, uh, burst of the real estate bubble will carry irreversible impacts on residential buy houses with mortgages. And I think one of the things that was really interesting is by having this kind of working with him with the data, he started to tell us the story about how the bank and the government are the same thing, right? So if they loan them money, the government bank, and they can't pay that back, the government often opens up another piece of land, gives them a loan for that piece of land so that they can pay off the previous piece of land. And now we're seeing the effects of that in the Chinese real estate market. As you hear a lot of these Chinese real estate development companies folding, this is many of the reasons why. Um, and then we talked to academics who talked about this addressing uh, uh, oversupply is looming ahead. So ground truthing isn't just about literally. We also did a project where we had the students go out to each building and check, like do a sample. We did like a random sampling of buildings. We went to them. So that kind of traditional ground truthing. But ground truthing can also be literally asking people. And I think having like visualizations and be able to communicate in that way is really important. And then we made an exhibit of the project here showing it to the public at large. So this 
um, exhibit allowed you to click on the map and then you would see like our ground truthing documentation on the screen above. So trying to bring this not just to the planners or policy experts, but to the broader public to have a conversation about what's happening. Okay, uh, so building teams uh, to create narratives around data for action is essential, I think, also. And you can see that in all of the projects that I've worked on so far, right, we had really strong teams. So, you know, we had people who are criminal justice policy advocates. We had people who are looking at uh, migration issues. You have petition. Now let's look at zoning. <laughs> Our team here in zoning. Um, and I don't know if anybody who has ever worked in zoning issues, um, but this is often the text you have. And here we wanted to think about how we can translate this very obscure data set into something that people could visualize and use. Um, so here our data set is actually the 4,000 pages of New York City zoning text. Um, and we um, basically created a, um, a way to understand that zoning by combining that zoning with, uh, we digitized each parcel and what their zoning was. We combined that with a GIS parcel map, and then we created a 3D massing. How many people are familiar with zoning in New York City? Few people. If you don't, if you're not familiar with it, every lot has a different zoning, which is based on a measurement of like how far you are from a street. How, what is the building across from you? What is the sky exposure plane? What, how far are you from a park? How far are you from a school? These are all things that you have to measure. And typically, you ask an architect to do that measurement along with a land use attorney. So if you want to buy a property, you hire an architect and a land use attorney to interpret those zoning rules for you. So we created, through this data set, an app that allows you to calculate your zoning in place, so here um, you can see I clicked and I actually aggregated those three lots together. This is what I'm allowed to build as of right. And then you can start to play around because as of right you can have lots of different bonuses. Um, you can start to add those. You might have different floor to height ratios and you can begin to add that. Um, you can actually uh, then Ex, like, export this data into a, a 3D. You can like turn on and off the, the buildings around it. Um, and then you can have a document that allows you to create a performa. Um, so if you're a real estate developer in the room, like, like the performa is like your base to understand your return on the investment. But once we did this, we realized that we actually had all of the available FAR in New York City. So we created a search tool that allows you to identify underdeveloped areas in the city. Um, so if you're looking for zoning and maybe something in like 200 to 500 um, range, um, you can find all the parcels that have that. Then you can look at um, particular neighborhood, Chelsea. Maybe you want to make sure it allows for a grocery store. And then you can find the lots that allow for that. Um, and then you can explore that lot. Um, here you can see it on the screen. And then you can see in this dotted line, this is what you can build as of right in that spot. But you might need to get bonuses or other kinds of things to build that as of right. So the tool allows you to say, what would you do if you made it all commercial? What would you do if you made it commercial, residential? What kind of mix? Um, you could change the floor heights um, and then allow you to add relevant bonuses. So here, there could be an affordable housing bonus. So it allows you to identify how much of that bonus you could acquire and add into your lot itself. We also had air rights data uh, from and 48th Street and down, so you we knew whether or not like adjacent properties had air rights, and you can buy air rights from prop in New York City. You can if you didn't completely build out your house, you can purchase air rights from the the adjacent property. 
Um, this is a crazy scenario. Uh, you could actually like begin to buy all these air rights. Like, no, but that would never happen. That would never happen, guys. But like, <laughs> but maybe you could find one of these property owners to give you some air rights to help build your uh, building, um, and you could add dormers and so forth. So, um, this was a company that I had uh, just recently sold that company. Um, so it's no longer available online. <laughs> Uh, just in the, the last month, but um, just shows you how you can collect data and turn it into a useful tool. But because I'm very interested in how data can be used for the public good, uh, one of the things that we use this tool is to help NYCHA think about its $2.2 billion of debt. And so when when we look at NYCHA properties in New York City, people are also t often talk about infill development, so like developing, like in like developing buildings inside a NYCHA. It's it's crazy idea, right? Like to actually like put this building in the middle of NYCHA housing project sounds like just crazy. So we thought, what if we could actually sell the underutilized air rights of NYCHA building? To help regain that debt. So because we had information about like your zoning mass, we could apply that to NYCHA building. So we work with NYCHA to create an air rights case study. So just to explain what I mean here, like an average NYCHA building is underdeveloped according to its FAR. So like you see here actually that like the amount of air rights you could have sometimes is five or more stories, technically. <laughs> um, and the idea is then could you, could NYCHA sell those additional air rights to properties adjacent to NYCHA housing projects in order for them to regain funds for that? So we worked with um, NYCHA to uh, like understand what and visualize that for local communities, what that proposal might mean. Um, so here, what you're looking at is um, these NYCHA, this NYCHA site, um, and then we are saying like who might potentially buy those air rights because they already as of right can build that high, right? So these buildings that have the yellow, are, those air rights are going to those buildings, but they actually, that is what they're allowed to build as of right. As you saw in that previous, like we don't always, like we can't always max out our as of right zoning. Um, and then these are the all the properties that are, uh, let's say 40% uh, built to their as of right. So we're saying you might potentially buy those air rights if you, um, if you would like redevelop that property, you would wanna be like 40 to 30% below the developable right to have an incentive to like actually want to buy these air rights. So we began to like calculate how much NYCHA, but then we're, like technically, like according to policy, this is like all that they really could sell the air rights to. So we started to talk about how they could distribute uh, those air rights um, throughout and kind of created this, um, these various uh, visualizations. All right, the last project, because I'm, I'm going over time, um, is a project that I just released uh, um, a month ago, and so maybe I'll just not talk about it too much because there hasn't had as much impact yet, but I'll just show it to you. So this is a project that I worked on uh, with the World Food Program again, the International um, uh, Food um, uh, uh, Policy Research Institute, the International Organization of Migration and the Mixed Migration Council. So the effect of that other migrant study, now I've been getting involved in a lot of migration studies. And similar to um, that previous project, they really wanted to understand migration from West Africa and to those people who end up in Libya. So we did in interviews of uh, people in Libya, where they came from, how they got there, how much it cost. Um, and again, we created a report and findings from that. Um, but we wanted to create a way to visualize this data in a way that would create more empathy for people interacting with it. So here what you see is uh, the dots are showing all of the locations in which our migrants came from. 
Then we created a migration pathway. Then we highlighted one migration path just to understand the risk along that path. Um, so here what you're seeing is uh, that one pathway. And then what we did is create a narrative of what it's like to go along that path. So here you're hearing the stories of migrants. As in West Africa, as soon as a migrant, many of the migrants are middle class um, or upper middle class. As soon as they make the passage of migration, they instantly become susceptible to smugglers um, and other, and they, they really become instantly vulnerable. So what we're trying to show are these different vulnerabilities in this risk layer. So we have, we each one of these layers is like its own study in and of itself. I could probably spend a whole hour talking about this, but uh, we'll just kind of cap it off here. But we had reported violence data along these routes that came from the Mixed Migration Council. They did interviews. Uh, we had data on um, uh, conflict events. We had data on smugglers. Uh, which, what you saw is that you're, you can go through each one of those data sets and then see what's actually happening at that location. So trying to contextualize that risk along with creating um, these narratives. Um, one of the things that this transect of data does at the, at the bottom is allows you to actually explore um, the different weights. But I, um, right, so these are all the locations that were in our interviews. And then we created this routing map. So we figured out where they were routed to. And then we created um, this one transect that we highlighted that's based on reported violence, conflict events, food security, reliance on smugglers, remoteness, and heat exposure. Each one of these maps that we created um, had a lot of data behind it. These are just some of the scenes. I'm gonna go through that very quickly. Um, but ultimately we created the, that risk transect by creating these risk maps. Um, and then we combined those risk mapping into this one uh, transect which then you can explore the risk at each part of the route. The World Food Program used this risk data to help send food and aid to the most riskiest locations. So it's not just that this data is being used to understand and show empathy for the route, but they use it as a way to understand where the needs of the migrants uh, were the highest. Um, and then we then took that data set to and transformed it um, and the idea of going across this way is to stop the narrative of south to north, but to rather like to think of it as a pathway um, of migrants uh, going through. And, uh, you know, one of the things is that, you know, many migrants don't, that leave the route don't realize that ECOWAS, so many West African countries have visa, open visa programs, so you're allowed to travel between them. But smugglers tell them that that is not the case and bribe them. So they become instantly vulnerable in this way um, uh, through lack of information. Um, and those are some of the narratives that go through this story. And I'll, I'll just stop because I could talk about this for quite a while. But here you can see the risk data and that we have a weighting scheme. And you can actually change that weighting scheme here um, if you're exploring with the data because it's really hard to know what like what what do you think is like the component that exhibits the most amount of risk and this was like a debate that we had between our group like no it's the smuggler risk that's the most problematic no it's like when you're in the sahara desert that's the most problematic but like no it's because you're in the sahara desert and a smuggler leaves you there for dead like anyways it gets very complicated so you're allowed to and people who are interfacing with it can uh, find their own insights uh, with the, the data. And I think I will stop here. Uh, I hope this uh, website has similar kinds of outcome of the previous projects that I showed you. And I invite you guys to all explore it. Thank you very much. Um, we do need to feed our guests, but we will take a couple questions before we. Great presentation, Sarah. Every time I go to a presentation of yours, I learn so much, not only about what you've done, but about what's possible. Thank you so much for coming here. 
I want to come back to your first guideline of do no harm, which is a little similar to Google's original do no evil. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, and, and I wonder, uh, you're, you're obviously uh, a person of incredible integrity, but so here's a question a bit out of left field. Do you think we need more protections in our data infrastructure systems or privacy so that people who aren't as benevolent and as well-intended as you couldn't use some of the same data that you use here for, let's say, evil purposes. You, you brought that up in the Nairobi case, and I'm just wondering from a policy perspective. Yeah. How vulnerable are we? Yeah. I, I'm going to answer that in two parts. One, I would say, well, this goes without saying, is that, you know, technology runs more, more rapidly than we can create regulations for it. So I think at a premise, and I, I forgot this principle, which is the seventh one, is that we need to create our own ethical standards because a lot of times we're working in territory that hasn't been navigated in terms of the regulation space as of yet. That's not to say I don't think we should regulate or think about regulation, so that's why it's a two-part answer. And I think that, you know, Absolutely, we need to create more regulations around the way that we use data. And the, you know, each data set has a different principle in which we should think about that or contextualize um, that regulation within. But I think like the problem that exists right now is that we're in a situation where for the government, regulation isn't really great for them. They're actually benefiting from this unregulated data set, whether they can buy the cell phone data and track us. So there's no incentive for the government to regulate. And so we're asking Google and Facebook to self-regulate, which is just crazy. And so I really believe we need to develop more intermediaries that are working between government and like the big tech companies in order to think about structures and type, like regulations. And I think academia is one good place for that, right? Like we actually navigate those two fields and it's up to us to actually push this area. I think it's really important for us and an important research area. Um, I also think the nonprofits and inter data intermediaries, but like there needs to be support and funding for those kinds of uh, data intermediaries. And when I think, when I'm talking about data intermediaries, like what I'm thinking here is, you know, I might be a nonprofit, I get the data from Facebook or Google, I make sure that the privacy is retained in that data set. Now, there's also a question of how, how private is something, but like, right, do we add differential privacy or other kinds of privacy? But I think that, like having that data intermediary or having that com somebody in between the government and the NGOs is something we really need to think more about. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess this is sort of related because in, in looking at your principles for action, you might just think that the sort of directives for people who are engaged in, in data practices, but they would be uh, grounded in more basic moral or normative principles things like do no harm, or things like uh, changing oppressive power structures, you know, uh, with a side constraint of doing no harm. But it seems like there would have to be, uh, you would need to meet more ethical principles than simply do no harm, <laughs> because that's not actually value. And so I assume that you have those values. Uh, and and uh, yeah. so then that, well, run, that runs up against the reply here where it's like, oh, well, we need to go create these things. It's like people already have these antecedent normative or moral commitments that aren't being made explicit. Yeah. And that itself could be part of a transparency condition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so I teach a, a data ethics class. So like one of, you know, there are a lot of ethics or codes or code, code of context conduct standards that are created. Uh, you know, I do a lot of work in the hand humanitarian community. I would say there's like at least 20 different code of conduct standards. And I encourage you guys all to look at those code of conducts. It's not just do no harm, but actually go dig into like what your community that you're working in says is kind of an ethical framework. But we also have to remember like to include our own ethics in that. But um, 
you know, I think these code of conduct standards, like just, you know, to take the humanitarian one, are really also very similar in that they are guiding principles in which we should be working with data, and they are super helpful and useful. Like thinking about cell phone data in the context of humanitarian rights can be very exploitative, and there's a lot of, uh, of discussion there. So I not just not just take your own moral precedence, but please do look at these code of ethics that are created in the lack of having a regulatory framework in which to understand this. So that's a very good good point. Um, like you know, health data has very uh, kind of rigid code of contact of like what uh, is privacy and what retains privacy, and so it's really important to be looking at those. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. Take one more. Okay. Um, thank you so much for sharing all Washington DC projects. Um, I'm a postal researcher in this building, and I'm very interested about the, the diversity in the projects. So it's kind of like different location, different topics, and a different research method. So my question is, so like, how did you come up with an idea for this project, and how did you evaluate this project to, before you start it? Yeah, so they come in all kinds of shape and form, like any research project. Um, I think the Nairobi work comes from like a deep-rooted care of the city and kind of investigation of that and kind of, you know, like the Madatu's project, like that money for the development of that data should have come out of the transport project, but I actually had to write a grant because they would not, you know, so it came from a, pa so some come from me writing the grant saying like, geez, this data should exist. Um, sometimes they come from a call for grant. So the uh, the China Go Cities came from a call for research about how can we create socially responsible real estate. They, like how can we create socially responsible real estate in China? I thought like, geez, that that's like an oxymoron. <laughs> like, like how do we like how do we create socially responsible real estate? And I thought like, what you know, some of the biggest issues like is exposing some of the problems in the current real estate. Uh, conditions might help us to create a more socially responsible risk. So it came more from an interest in a call for a grant and that the migration projects and all of them came from I have always been interested in migration uh, as a like climate migration and migration is a, a very like big issue that we face right now. I mean it's one of the biggest human problem since the beginning of time, like the movement of people through, but um, also very critical now as we think of climate change. And I actually um, was introduced to a colleague at the World Food Program who was also interested, and then we started to think about what we could do together. And so it, it came through that kind of uh, connection. So that was that first Central American project. Um, yeah, so different ways, yeah. But an interest, a general interest in using data to help people on the margins of society. I mean, the China case, you know, like, I don't think that the, the risk is to all of us. The Chinese real estate market is tied into the global marketplace, right? So, like, the Chinese real estate market going down has an effect on all of us, not just China, right? And I think that's something that I was interested in that. And actually, like, that... Evergrande story came out and the kind of these kinds of things that we were finding in that um, did expose some of that. All right, I'm gonna have to cut it off here. So thank you very Thanks. much. Awesome. And, um,